Okay. Um, so we are done now with program assignment one. You now have homework, written homework two and program assignment two because everybody should stay busy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, uh, so, so on programming, uh, on both of these, it is perfectly okay to ask questions to me or to to uh, to Young. Um, if the question is about actual ideas from the course, like I need to understand pipelining or I need to understand multipolar, it's easy if you ask it on the website because I can write a much longer answer. If it's about the actual homework. Like, I do not understand question five. WeChat is a good place to ask that question. But if you want me to give a long, actual answer, then, then writing it somewhere else is a little easier. Okay, so yesterday we were in here for a very long time. And you have plenty of things to go do. So today I will try and be more brief. Okay, so uh, let's get started. So on Monday, on Monday, we talked about <coughs> scheduling. We talked a lot about how to organize computations so that all of the processes are always doing about the same amount of work. And when I talked about CUDA, we also talked about scheduling. I talked a lot about how a CUDA thread runs on CUDA cores. <coughs> so today, I want to not talk about making sure that every, every processor does the same amount of work, I want to talk about optimizing programs to, to reduce the amount of communication between those processes. So if we go back to the demos on the first day, most of our problems were it was very long to communicate between two students. And so today we'll start talking about some of the uh, uh, some of the ideas on how to reduce communication. And some of these ideas may be very helpful to you in assignment two. Okay, so I want to go back to this example. I try to not have too many examples in class so we don't have to, to learn too much code. But if you can remember from Monday, on Monday we talked about this example and it was a parallel program on a matrix, on a grid, and the workload was completely in parallel, run this code for all the black cells. So update the black cells by taking the average of the red cells. Um, and keep doing this until the values stop changing too much. So this is the update, AIJ equals left, uh, right, top, bottom average them together, and then the difference is new value minus old value, and if the difference changed too much, we kept going, if the difference did not change, we stopped. So this was the example that we talked about last time. Okay. So we talked about several ways to write this program. We talked about for all loops, we talked about using walks and barriers. And I want to start today's lecture by talking about one more way to think about this program. Um, and I want, to, I want to talk about it in terms of message passing. So before, all of our processors read the same variables and wrote to the same variables. We had one memory, many processors, all processors read and write to the same variables. And we use locks, we use barriers to keep everything okay. Now today, I want you to think about, or right now, I want you to think about a new computer that does not have multiple processors in one memory. For example, think about a cluster of computers. So the lab that you run um, your assignments on is a cluster of, I think, 16 computers. And they are connected via network, via Ethernet. But if one of the processors, with, you know, one of the computers, wants to access memory in another computer, it cannot just say, load this value, this address in another computer. We have to send a message. It might be HTTP, it could be you know, like over the internet. 
send a message to the other computer, and it will respond with the data. For example, if I go to a website, if I go to Baidu, I do not ask, you know, my, my laptop doesn't say, Baidu, I want to load address 45 at Baidu. It says that I want this particular piece of data, please send it to me. So I send the web server a message, the web server sends me back the answer in a message. So I want you to think about now as I have a new parallel computer, which is formed of multiple computers connected via Ethernet. And now when one computer wants data, it will send its variable x to computer 2, and it might give a message a name, an ID. And if computer 2, friend 2 running on computer 2, wants to receive that data, it says, I expect to receive some data. I'm going to put it in my own variable y. I want to receive it from processor 1, and I'm expecting the message to have this ID. So notice that now we have two address spaces. This computer has its own memory. That computer has its own memory. The variable x is a variable over here. The variable y is a variable over there. It is not possible for this processor to just load x. It's to load y. It is not possible for that processor to just load x. So if a processor wants the data from another machine, it needs to receive a message from that machine. And so in this case, this is sending the data in x over to processor y. So there are now three com two commands, send and receive. So now if we wrote the solver, and if you recall, we divided the grid across the processors before. Well, really, we didn't divide the grid. We just said that this processor is responsible for this part of the grid. This processor is responsible for computing this part of the grid, and so on and so on. But now, I'm actually going to divide the grid across, let's say, four processors. So now every machine has one-fourth of the whole grid, of the whole matrix. And so after I update all of, let's say, I, I don't, I'm not coloring the cells red and black anymore, but imagine that I do an update of all the cells, and now I need to do the next iteration. How is thread 2 going to know what the latest values owned by thread 3 are? it needs to receive these values back to thread 2. And so that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to allocate in thread 2 a little bit of extra memory, this line and this line. And in that extra memory, thread 2 is going to wait for a message from thread 3 and thread 1 and so thread 2 will keep a copy of these values. Because remember, to compute this value here, thread 2 needs this value, this value, this value, and this value. So we need to copy this value over here. So I'm going to send a message that contains this whole row of the grid to thread 2. And I'm going to send a message from this whole row of the grid to thread 1. So you can kind of see that right here is, um, imagine that there's one thread on every processor. Every thread has an ID, so I know if I'm one, two, or three. And, th and the thread will receive data into its grid zero, zero. So if this is one big matrix of size n divided by four plus two, then zero, zero is this data. And n over 4, or rows per thread, is uh, plus 1, is this data. So notice that the allocation per processor is n over 2, the whole width, plus rows per thread, which would be n over 2 divided by 4, plus 2. Extra row on top, extra row on bottom. And notice that, oh sorry, I don't show it there. So we will read into the first row, or 
receive a message and put the data in the first row, and we receive a message and put the data in the last row. And now, thread two can do the computation to update all of the black dots. So now I'm going to show you the code, and you're going to see there's a lot more code. So if this was the easiest way to express the program, now I'm going to express it as messages, and it'll look a little bit like this. So now it's getting a little bit more complex. So let's, let's slowly go through this. So remember, every thread has its own copy of the array. And whenever it needs updated values, it sends messages to, its, to, to next door threads and receive messages from next door threads. OK. So first of all, rows per thread is n over get number of threads, n over 4. And then I allocate an array that's rows per thread plus 2 times n. So this is, while not done, let's think through what this is doing. So if thread ID is not 0, if it's not the first row or the first thread, we will send our first row to the processor above us. And we will send our last row to the processor below us. Now, why is this 1, 0? It's 1, 0 because in my array, this row 1, not row 0, is the first row that I, so I am supposed to process. Because remember, row 0 is going to be the data that comes from the processor above me. And then, of course, I will receive, if I'm not the first thread, I'm going to receive the row from the processor above me and then I'm going to receive a row from the processor below me. And when I get a row from above, I put it in row 0. If I get a row from below, I put it in rows per thread plus 1. Make sense? Okay. Then we do work. Then we actually do the computation, and notice that I'm iterating from i equals 1, not 0, to rows per thread plus 1. So I'm skipping the first row, because that's data I received. And I'm only processing the rows that I'm responsible for, that this thread is responsible for. OK, very good. So now, take a look at this code down here. And take a moment with your partners to discuss what in the world is happening here. Because remember, before, this was the code to check, are we done? Should we stop iterating? No more while loops. Talk for a second to figure out how this works. So a bunch of messages get sent here. Okay? So I'll give you one minute to think a little bit about the code.
but the, the last column is, uh, has root enough? Or no, let's say it's no, yeah, fake data. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I was using pseudocode here because I didn't want to. Let's say the first, the first is row. Okay. Because it's on the last slide. Is it not first? Oh, no. Let me see. So, yes. No, that's consistent. The class two is the first record, but in the second. Oh, that's, that's not true. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, should, be, should be what? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's prefer to is that consistent with this allocated risk for this yeah. Sorry. Okay. So let's let's talk about this. How how do we send messages so that all threads know when the program is done? So what is this? Let's start here. If thread ID is not zero. Okay. Correct. So if for every thread except for thread zero, the thread will send a message to thread zero, which says, here is how much the local value of diff has changed. Okay. Where does thread zero receive all those messages? Where in the code? So if all of these processors send to thread zero, where does thread zero receive the messages? Right here. So if I if this is thread zero, for all processors, for all other threads, except for zero, start at one, receive that message and add it up. So now we have the final answer. So if we are done, thread zero is the only thread that knows we are done at this point. And so what does thread zero do? It sends a message back to all the other processors saying, I have computed that we should all stop. Or I have computed that we should all continue. <coughs> and where does that pro where do all the other processors receive that message? Right here. Exactly. So I've, I've basically implemented a barrier. I so when every thread gets to this point, tell thread zero, and then thread zero determines whether or not we are done, and thread zero will announce to everybody that we are done. Mm -hmm. Very good, so, so that's how we think about messages. So, so here's a question, why are there no locks? Remember the last class? So, so remember last time we said, oh, every thread can update its own difference value, and then at the very end, one thread will take a lock and compute the sum. <clears throat> That's sort of what I'm doing here. I'm doing exactly the same thing. Every thread computes its own local my diff, and then one thread sums them all up. Why no locks? <laughs> Correct. Exactly. So there is. The, why do we have locks? We have locks, or in the example from the last class, we have a lock to prevent two threads from modifying the same variable at the same time. But in a computer that's message passing, it is not possible for any two threads to access the same variables at the same time, because all threads have their own variables. So you will never need a lock in a message passing system because every thread has its own variables. It is impossible to share variables. You can share information by sending messages, but you can't share a memory address space. So there's no way for there to be locks. So in this program, you guys, you all did a very good job. There's, there's no 
notice a few things, like the array indexing, my indices were not for the entire matrix. My indices were for the piece of the matrix that every thread owned. Communication was not done by reading and writing shared variables. Communication was done by passing messages around. And synchronization, like barriers or locks, well, we, we just, we used messages to coordinate all of the threads. So that's how we did synchronization. Um, and, and of course, most libraries will have convenient things for you to use. Um, so that you don't have to write all the low-level code yourself. Um, but that's not, not so important. So <clears throat> I want to talk about two different types of send and receive. So the first type is what I put on the, the board here. Or sorry, in the example. And I'm going to call it a blocking send. And it's called blocking because a thread, when it calls the send function, the send function will not return until the receiver has received the message. So in a blocking send, let's think about the sender thread, let's think about the receiver thread. The sender thread calls send. And then the data might be copied to the network, it might be sent over the network, the message moves over to the other computer. At some point, the other computer calls receive, Data is copied from the network into this computer's address space and receive returns. And this computer might send another message back to the original computer saying, I have the data, everything is okay. And once that ACK, or ACK here is short for acknowledgement, like saying, okay, I have it. Then the call to send returns. So in my code, here, this call to send does not return until the other processor says, everything is okay, I have your message. And the same thing is true of a blocking receive. A blocking receive, red calls receive, when receive returns, the data, in this case, the variable bar, has all the data. So you can immediately use the variable bar. Okay. So, given this, something interesting happened on the last slide. There was actually a bug, and nobody noticed the bug in my code. Well, there was a little bug, but that's not the one I'm talking about. <laughs> there was actually a very fundamental bug in my code. So let's go back to the code. And remember, send does not return until the other person, other thread, has received the message. And receive does not return until the, uh, <clears throat> the message has been received. So my claim is that there's a very big problem in this code. So why don't you talk about it for a second and see if you can figure out what the big problem is. This is not, this is a very big mistake. <laughs> see a problem? No problem. Okay. So let's try something. Imagine that all of you are processors. Okay? And we are going to act out this code. So look what this code does. The first thing that happens is that we will send data to the processor above them on my picture. And let's say that the processor above me is in front of you in this class. Okay. So 
Let's go ahead and act out this code. So everybody needs to look in front of them and tell the person in front of them, hello. So send them a message. And, but you cannot send your second message until the person turns around and looks at you and says, okay, hello. But remember, you cannot turn around until the other person turns around and looks at you and says, okay, I got your message. So try it out and see what happens. So everybody lean forward. Okay. So what is wrong with this code? So when does the first send return? Does it ever return? No. Right? Because this send does not complete, does not return until the receiver calls receive. But the receiver cannot call receive because it is waiting for someone else to send. Or for someone else to receive the message it is sending. So this is a situation where this program calls send and just stops. So how can we fix this problem? There's actually a very, very simple fix. Yeah? Uh, the email row uh, first receive the old row first send. Exactly. So if you are an even thread, I want you to send. Lean forward, tell your neighbor hi. If you are an odd thread, you need to receive first, and then you will send. And so we will get in a situation that looks more like, like this. So if you're even, you send first, and then you receive. If you are odd, you receive first, and then send. And so then I will have matched all of you up. And there will be no uh, uh, deadlock. So we would have called this original program here, with the big mistake in it, it will deadlock. Because everybody will just turn and say, and that's it. Nothing else will happen. Okay, now there's another type of send that I will call an asynchronous send or a non-blocking send. And a non-blocking send will say, when I call send, when a thread calls send, it returns immediately. So I can say send someone a message and then I can just go start con continuing my program. So now when I call send, all I get back is saying, here's the ID of the message that you sent. If you ever want to know if it, is, if it has been received, you can check later using this ID. So, or the ID I'm calling a handle. It's a handle, it's a reference, it's an ID to the message. So in the asynchronous version, call send, the message is now being sent. Maybe it takes a while. But at the exact same time, concurrently with the message being sent, the thread keeps running. So in Silk, we had an asynchronous function call, right? We said we call a function, and the function may go in parallel with the calling thread. This is an asynchronous message sent. And of course, receive, asynchronous receive is the same thing. It's saying, I'm expecting a message from this other thread. I'm going to go do some other things, and later on I can check, check receive, if, my message, if I have received the message. So even though you've called asynchronous send, you are not guaranteed that the message has been sent until you check to see, has it been sent? And, and the answer is yes. And on receive, you can call asynchronous receive, but you cannot use the value that you were trying to read it to until you check to see if the value has actually been received. So these are more advanced versions of send and receive. And why do you think we have an asynchronous send and receive? How does this relate to the idea of multi-threading? 
Multi-threading is when whenever something that's going to take a while needs to be done, let's go do something else. So let's run multiple instruction streams concurrently. This is the same thing, except what we are doing concurrently is we are running a thread concurrently with sending a message. Okay, so are there any questions about message passing? Message passing makes it really clear that communication is expensive. Because I can say we will send a message and we will wait for the message to get there. Okay, so now I want to talk about one more idea. I want to talk about traffic. So <clears throat> let's say, let's say, so, so one example is I have noticed in walking around campus that everyone likes to visit Xinhua. There are a lot of tourists on campus. So Yang and I entered through the gate yesterday and we showed our keys and we got right in. But there were many tourists that could not get in. So let's assume that many people want to come here and they want to visit Qinghua. So everybody gets in their cars, very nice cars. <laughs> They're from Shanghai. And, and they get in their cars. And let's say that people want to drive from Shanghai to Beijing. And so this takes, uh, it's about 1,200 kilometers between Shanghai and Beijing. And I think I have that right. And let's just say that the car will drive at 100 kilometers per hour. Okay? So, first question here, this is a review. What is the latency of the operation from driving from Shanghai to Beijing? It's 12 hours. That's the latency. Okay, good. Now, here's a question of, let's say we will be very inefficient. But these are, these are expensive cars, so we don't want any, any accidents. So we only allow one car on the road at a time. So one car drives to Beijing, and then when that car gets to Qinghua, another car can leave and also drive on the road. So you were correct when you said the latency was 12 hours. What is the throughput in this case? One car every 12 hours, or, or one twelfth a car per hour. That's how many cars per hour. Correct. So the latency, 12 hours. The throughput, given my very inefficient driving rules, is one car every 12 hours. So let's say I wanted to increase the throughput. So one way to increase the throughput is I have a Lamborghini. So I can drive much faster than 100 kilometers per hour. Let's say I can drive 200 kilometers per hour. So the throughput is now one car or one person every six hours. Right? So it's one sixth cars per hour. But this is not how we normally increase throughput on our highways. What would be another way that most cities use to increase throughput on highways? Sorry? More lanes. We build wider highways. So now if I want, you know, I still only have one car per lane. Ignore, you know, not very practical, but it's okay. Um, so now I have four cars every 12 hours. This is back to 100 kilometers per hour. Four cars every 12 hours, and now I'm at one third cars per hour. My throughput. So it's, this this highway is better than the fast one lane fast car. Now, of course, we also can use the highway more efficiently. So let's say that now I'm going to spread out the cars by one kilometer. Still not that efficient, but you know, they are Lamborghinis. You have to be careful. Okay, so. So now, what is the latency of, of driving from Shanghai to Beijing? Still, still 12 hours. No change to the latency. What is the throughput? It's one car 
Pa? Every one one hundredth of an hour, or or one hundred cars per hour, is my throughput. So one hundred cars cross, you know, get to Beijing every hour. And of course, I can use a big highway too. And now I'm at four hundred cars per hour, four hundred people per hour. So notice that I can increase throughput in two different ways, wider and also more people on the road without changing latency. So we normally think of latency and throughput as two very different things. Okay. So this building more lanes made sense. Everybody understands that. Pushing the cars closer together is actually a form of something we do in communication all the time called pipeline. So I'll give you another example. So imagine that you are doing your laundry, okay? And there are three steps to this operation. So you have to wash your clothes, and if you have a dryer, you could dry your clothes. And then of course someone needs to fold the clothes so they go back in your, in your closet, okay? So let's say that, that washing the clothes takes 45 minutes. Drying the clothes, 60 minutes. Folding the clothes, 15 minutes. So what is the latency between taking your dirty laundry to having clean clothes in your closet? Two hours, correct. Now, if we wanted to increase the throughput, we can't change the machines, can't, can't work any faster. If we wanted to double the throughput, what could we do? We could buy another washer, we could buy another dryer, and we could go find another friend to help us pull our laundry. Right? So now I have two or one load of laundry per hour, right? Two loads every two hours. So that's throughput of one. Now, but the problem is that I paid twice as much. Right? I had to buy two washers, I had to buy two dryers, I had to pay twice as much to get throughput of one washer, or one, uh, uh, one load of laundry per hour. So, imagine that you did not have one load of laundry. Imagine you have not done your laundry for four weeks. So you have all of these dirty clothes, many dirty clothes. And in fact, most students never do one load of laundry. They always do, like, don't do laundry for four weeks. And then they do all of their laundry all at once. Okay. So imagine that the goal is not to process one load of laundry, but many all at the same time. Okay. So let's think about this. And now I'm going to draw this out where time is this direction. And so the first load of laundry, notice it takes, and every tick is 15 minutes. So the first load of washing your clothes, 45 minutes, one, two, three, correct, yeah. Drying, one, two, three, four, one hour. Folding, 15 minutes. So the first load of laundry takes one hour, or sorry, two hours, two hours. Now the second load of laundry, would you start the second load of laundry right here? No, nobody would do that. As soon as the washer was done, you would put your clothes in the washer. So you would start the second load of laundry right here. And so on and so on. So if we continue this, what is the latency of doing one load of laundry? The latency, the time from the start to the end, two hours. What about down here? Still two hours. What is my throughput? Remember, I only have one washer, one dryer. My throughput is now one per hour. It's the same as if I went back and bought two, uh, it's the same as if I had two of these. 
and put every load of laundry in when the other one was completely done. So notice that I really have parallelism here. I can parallelize washing and drying and folding. And by using that parallelism, I have a throughput of one load of laundry per hour. And the way you can read that off the graph is just look at the distance between finishing times of every load. Every hour, another one gets done. Therefore, the throughput must be one per hour. Now, so yes, yeah, so the latency, two hours, throughput, one. Now, this is something that's kind of interesting, is, is, the, is the dryer working all the time? And is the washer working all the time? So the dryer is working here to here, here to here, here to here, here to here. Dryer is working all the time. Is the washer working all the time? Here to here, not working, not working, not working. So why is the dryer working all the time, but the washer not working all the time? Because the washer gets done quicker. So our throughput is actually based on the slowest piece of the link. Right, so the, in this case, it's the uh, it's the, Dry. the dryer, and in fact, the the person is actually only busy one fourth of the time. So why am I telling you any of this? I'm telling you this because this is how most computers actually work. So so far in this class, I've actually told you, I've told you, a processor can do one instruction per clock. And often I have told you that both the throughput and the latency was one. But it really, the latency is usually not one, but the throughput is very close to one. So if I break how to execute an instruction down into smaller steps, like fetch or read the instruction, decode the instruction, execute the instruction, write the results back to registers, in this simple processor, an instruction actually has a latency of 4. But well, what's the throughput? 1. Right? Because these are completely different execution units. And one instruction can be doing uh, fetch, while the next instruction is, sorry, one instruction can be doing fetch, while another instruction is doing decode, while another instruction is executing, while another one is finishing. So when we say an instruction pipelining or pipelining, that's what we mean. We have a sequence of steps. We have different hardware that runs completely in parallel doing each of those steps. And that allows us to get high throughput regardless of what the latency is. Notice that I can still be throughput of one instruction per clock if for whatever reason we made an eight-stage pipeline. And a modern CPU pipeline can be 15 or sometimes 20 stages. So the analogy, the, the example about driving to Beijing is when I divided the road into small segments and I said that different cars can be in different parts of the road, I kind of was pipelining the task of driving from Shanghai to Beijing. Right? And the smaller I make the pieces, the closer the cars get together, or equivalently, the more pipeline stages there are, I can, make, I can maximize my throughput and get higher throughput, uh, even though I do not change the latency. OK. So I think everybody understands latency and bandwidth quite well right now. So that's a good place to start. So, so why am I telling you all of this? So the, the, the theme of this lecture was about fast communication. So now let's start going back to messages. 
So imagine that we had a link between two processors, a network. And I could send a message over the network between processor 1 and processor 2. And it would take time t naught, time t0, to get across the network. And then imagine that that network had bandwidth b. So b bits per second. So the total time it took to get a message over the network would be t0, the amount of time for it takes the first bit to arrive, plus the amount of time for the rest of the message to finish up, which would be b uh, n over b. So if communication is not pipeline, if there's no way to break the network into small pieces, well, that's like one car driving on the road the entire time. So here, it's if I wanted to send three messages, I would wait T0 for the first bit of the message to get to the other end, and then N over B for the rest of the message. And then T0 plus N over B, and then T0 plus N over B. So that would be one message could be sent at a time, no parallelism. And so effectively, what's the actual bandwidth? Well, the bandwidth is messages per second, or bytes per second. And so the bandwidth would be, for every this amount of time, I send n bytes. So n over t of n. So for large periods of time, a lot of the network is wasted. So now let's think about breaking the network into two pieces. So now I have processor 0, or processor 1 sends, processor 2 receives, but there's two steps. There's one step is when processor 1, when a thread on the, on the sender calls send, the CPU has to copy the data to the network. The network has to send it over the first link. Network then has to send over second link. So there's two links. So the total latency of sending a message is all of these steps. Copying the data to the network, sending over link 1, sending over link 2, and then copying data back to the other processor. So in this case, there's four steps. But look what happens when we pipeline the messages. So if I have to send a lot of messages, the first message takes all four of those steps. The second message can start as soon as the processor is done with the first message. The, set, the message 2 can start as soon as the processor is done with message 1. And so on and so on. Just like the doing laundry. Now notice here that the longest piece of the, of the pipeline is the blue. Is this link. This is like the dryer in the other example. So the rate at which I can send messages depends on how long this segment of the network is. And let's think about what happens. So, so the processor can like copy messages to the network much faster than the network can send them. So imagine that as soon as the first message gets copied to the network, the network starts sending it. So the yellow box is right next to the blue box. But after the first message, or after message one, as soon as the message is copied to the network, the, me the network doesn't send it for a while. So why doesn't the network send it? Because it's busy sending the first me as message zero. So I wrote one here to say that there is one message waiting. So right here is when message one starts being sent. Right here is when message 2 gets copied to the network. So again, there's one message waiting. Right here is when message 3 gets copied to the network. Now there are two messages waiting. And <clears throat> so now it's down to one message is waiting again, two messages waiting, and so on and so on. So if we had a big buffer between the CPU and the network, that buffer would just get uh, more full and more full and more full. So notice what happens 
right here. So the processor is completely busy. It's always working. Back, 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 back. But then all of a sudden the processor stops. And the processor stops because I said here that assume the network buffer can hold at most two messages. So the processor is very quickly copying messages to the network. The, mess the network is slowly sending messages to the other computer. And at some point, this buffer fills up to be two. And so when this buffer fills, the CPU has to stop. When the buffer drains to one, the CPU starts again. When the buffer fills to two, the CPU stops. When the buffer drains, the CPU starts again. So that's why it doesn't matter how fast the orange or the gray bars are. They will always have to stop and wait for the blue bars. But also notice that the performance, the speed of this, depends on 1 over this amount of time. That is the, the throughput. Not 1 over that amount of time. Because everything is going in parallel. So even though I'm talking about messages being sent between computers, it's very possible that messages in any modern computer are not sent between two completely different computers, but they could actually be sent between processors on the same chip, or they could be sent between memory and the cache. So whenever I say communication, I just want you to think about moving data. It doesn't need to be messages between two completely different computers or one website to the other. It's any type of communication. Memory to caches, caches to cores, L1 cache to L2 cache. Any type of communication can be pipeline. So how many people in, this, in the class, um, if I say uh, a cache, who knows what a cache is? You, you kind of know what it is. What is the, and, and, I, and, and so, let's, let's still go over a small review. Let's go over a very small review. So imagine that I had my, my grid from the grid solver workload. And let's just say for now the grid is 8 by 8. Ignore n, just specifically 8 by 8. And imagine I had a cache, and a cache <coughs> has room for, uh, 32 bytes, very, very small cache. And the cache is organized into lines, into blocks of data of size uh, 16 bytes <coughs> in this case. So four, four numbers, 16 bytes. So there are 16 bytes of data that the processor can, can read from, uh, that if it reads those, they will be very, very fast. Does anybody know what the cache block or cache line size on my computer is? Intel computer? 64 bytes. In my cartoon, in my, my picture here, I made it 16 just to make it a little easier. And so the point of a cache is to hold data, or data so that if a processor ever accesses data again, it will be very fast. So I want you to think about how the cache would behave if we had code that processed all the elements like this. Okay. So I wrote the addresses, on, and let's just say every one of these elements is 4 bytes. One integer, one floating point number. So that would be address 0, address 4, address 8, address 12, address 16, address 32, sorry, uh, sorry address 16, uh, 32 is here. So that's 0 x 20. Okay. And what I wrote here is I wrote, imagine these are all of the data ac uh, addresses accessed as the program goes through, through, through. So I just want to make sure everybody is thinking about what data is in cache and what data is not ca in cache. So when the processor accesses 0, 0, I wrote up. Ah, that means that the processor will take a miss, because the data is not in cache, and it will bring 
that hash line in the cache. Now when the, when the processor accesses this element here, I said it is a cache hit. So there's no loads from memory there. The, line, the, the data, those, those four bytes were in the cache, and it's a cache hit. So there is no cache miss until we get to byte 16. So when we get all the way over here, we say, uh oh, the data is not in cache, and the cache will load that data. And that will be true for the next four accesses because the data is already in cache because this is a 16 byte cache line. So now I have 16 bytes and 16 bytes in my cache. Now I access this piece of data, address 32. Address 32 is not in cache, so there's a cache miss. But the cache is full. So in this example, I decided to use a least recently used policy, or a, the cache line that is the oldest I'm going to get rid of, or that has not been accessed in the most recent amount of time. And in that case, it's this pink one. So I throw this line out of cache, read line 20 in, and then hit, 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 hit. When I get to line 20, uh, uh, 48, for, uh, 0x30, this is the line that's the oldest. So I throw it out, bring in the new data, hit, 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 throw it out, and so on and so on. Okay, so that, that is an okay review of how a cache works. So for, for this class, you can assume that a cache reads in data in lines, here 16 bytes, my computer 64 bytes, and that it's, it's reasonable to assume that the cache gets rid of the oldest data. Every time it needs more room to bring in more data, it will get rid of the oldest data to make it fit. And so you'll get a pattern that looks like this. So these are the, the 32 bytes that are in the cache. Okay, so now I'm going to skip this slide. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip this slide for a second. And I'm going to talk about this. So now let's go think about the grid solver application. So imagine that a thread is trying to update this value. And to update that value, I claim that these are the three lines that will be brought into the cache. Because we have to read the data above. <coughs> current row, and next row. So that's why I colored these three lines. Okay. And now let's assume that I, I changed my cache a little bit, and it's now, there's uh, uh, six lines in the cache. So my previous diagram, there were only two, two cache lines that fit in the cache. Now let's say there are six. So the cache is uh, 24 times 4, uh, 96 bytes. So let's say we move, we iterate in this direction. So we go here. And by the time I get to the end, <laughs> notice that this data is no longer in cache. Because this data and this data is in cache. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six lines. The cache is full. And to make room for these, this data had to leave the cache. So what happens when I want to update this value? Will there be any cache misses? Yes, there will be cache misses, right? So I get to here, and now even though I want to process this data, even though it used to be in cache, it is no longer in cache because it's been kicked out by the data over here. So this program, for every single time it loads a new value, it will load three cache lines. It will hit, 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 and then load three more cache lines. Hit, hit, hit. So this program loans, loads three cache lines for every four elements that it processes. 
So this is an example of, you know, we don't really need to reload this data because we already actually loaded it into the processor. So the fact that we have to load it again is sort of because of how the computer works. It's not fundamental to the algorithm. So that's why I wanted to go back here really quickly, is I want to distinguish between communication that's absolutely necessary and communication that is not absolutely necessary but is a, a, occurs because of how computers work. So absolutely necessary communication, I will use the word inherent. It is inherent to the algorithm. There's no way to avoid it. Artifactual communication is a communication that is an artifact of how caches or networks behave. So if we had better computers or we were smarter with how we wrote our code, we might be able to avoid this part of it. So for example, some communication absolutely has to happen. So like in the grid solver, these elements have to be sent to this processor. Otherwise, we could not perform the algorithm. This processor needs this information. And so one way to, to think about how efficient your program is, because remember, we can, we can pipeline everything. We want our program to always be doing math instructions. We never want the CPU to stop. So a nice way to think about how efficient a program is, is to think about the ratio of the amount of communication it does to the amount of compute it performs. And I'm sorry I'm bouncing back, but let me give you an example of why that ratio is important. Is here, this is the CPU doing work. And the CPU has to stop doing work because it is waiting for communication. If the yellow box was longer than the blue box, then the CPU would always be doing work always be doing useful work. So it's the ratio, it's the relative cost of blue to yellow tells me how efficient my CPU is. And remember, we want CPUs to be working all the time. So one way, okay, so, so this idea of communication to computation ratio is usually a very good metric for how efficient your program will be. And uh, so communication to computation ratio is bytes transferred divided by work done. Or if you may be interested in flipping it over and doing work done divided by bytes transferred, because then bigger is better. And a lot of people refer to this as arithmetic intensity. So a very intense application does a lot of math and very little communication. And how you write your code can very much change this number. Like for example, if I, if I divided the work across the processors this way, well, what is the communication to computation ratio? Here. Like, what would it be? It would be elements computed per processor, n squared over p. Elements communicated per processor to n. So n squared over p divided by 2n is about O of n over P, about O of n. So this is work done per unit communicated. But what happens if I interleave things? If I interleave things, the ratio is not so good, right? If I, if I interleave things, the elements computed over the elements communicated is actually one half. For every row of, of data that I compute, I need to receive this row of data and this row of data. So there, it went, uh, work per unit communication went up as the data got bigger. Here, it stays constant. Not good. Can anybody think of a way to do better than this? There's a way to, to divide work to processors that gives me an even better ratio of, than n over p. Here's a hint. This ratio 
is the area of this region compared to sort of the perimeter of that region. And if I wanted to maximize area versus perimeter, what shape would I choose? Circle, sure, but that's kind of tricky. <laughs> I might go with squares. So instead of split the, pro the program up into big rows, why don't I split it up into the processors by blocks? So let's figure out what it is now. So, okay, so there's n squared elements. There's p processors. So elements per processor is still n squared over p. Nothing changed. But what about the elements communicated? Well, that is sort of four times the length of a side. Well, what's the length of a side? The length of a side is n over square root p. Because if there's p processors, so there's nine, that's right, there's three blocks. There's square root p blocks in any direction. So n squared over p divided by n over root p is now n over root p. So here, n over root p, before it was n over p. So as the processors get larger, as the processors get larger, as, as I get more processors, I get a lot more communication. But the amount of communication goes up more slowly. It goes up as root p with this scheme, and goes up as p with this scheme. So this would be a much more clever way to divide the work to processors if I had a bunch of processors. Okay. So here's another example. I just told you that if I iterate over the rows this way, when I come back to here, the data is not in cache. I have to load it from memory again. Can you think of a way to change this program to make it more efficient, to change, to reduce the amount of data I load from memory. So if I go all the way to the end of the row, by the time I come back, the data is not in cache. Is there a way I can be a little smarter? Is there a way I can be a little smarter? So let me, uh, how about this? How about I go and then make sure that I, 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 I make it into small chunks so that whenever I come back to the beginning, the data is still in cache. So if I come back to here, one, two, three, there's only three elements. And um, like if I start here, I'm only using six things of data, and I can actually stay in cache. So you'll see a lot of examples of, of chunking things together, iterating in blocks, so that if data is sitting here in cache, when I come back down, it's still there. Or when data is sitting in cache here, when I come back down, it's still there. Here's another example. So imagine you're writing MATLAB code, or you're using NumPy in Python. And all of these, these libraries have call, function calls to add two vectors of numbers. They might look like this. <laughs> so imagine there's, there's multiply, there's add. So if I have two arrays and I want to multiply them together, um, I can call uh, add, and then multiply, and then add. And this is very, very pretty code. This is code that we all sort of write. We use a library to multiply two arrays, or add two arrays. And this code right here is the exact same as this code. It does the exact same thing. Right? Notice here what I did is I iterate once, and I process everything for one element at a time. So in this code, it's I iterate over all the elements, I do one add, and then I come back, and then I do one multiply, and then I come back and do another add. 
In this case, I say for one element, do all the operations. Which program do you think is better? Faster. This one might be uh, easier to read, but... Uh, um, which program do you think is faster? First one? Second one. Why second one? Because the data is, is near. Sorry? <coughs> because the data is near. It's near. So let's, let's, let's think about it more rigorously. So we know about being bandwidth bound. You know about this from program 5. You know that if you are bandwidth bound, you cannot make your program much faster. You figured that out last night. This program is very bandwidth bound. This is very much like program 5 on homework. Right? So this operation does two loads and one store. Same thing for multiply. Two loads, one store. So for every math operation, it does three memory operations. So overall, this program has an uh, work done per unit move of data communicated of one third. This program does four loads, one, two, three, four, one store. So it does five memory operations, but does uh, three math operations. One, two, three. So the ratio is three fifths. So we went from 33% to 60%. Almost twice doing the same math, almost half fewer memory operations. So if this was bandwidth bound, this program should run about two times faster. And that's a big deal. <laughs> and that's a very big deal. Um, I will skip this one. One more example. Imagine that you did divide the grid up into squares. And I told you it was much, much better. Because you only had to communicate these elements. Right? So that was good. But remember, all the communication works in terms of cache lines, not elements. So even though the necessary communication is the red dots, this machine moves entire cache lines. So you will pay for the cost of moving all of the elements in this line. So there's a constant factor of maybe 4 or 64 times everything that you read. So even though this is a much better uh, assignment theoretically, in practice, you have to keep in mind that even though you only needed to move the red dots, this might actually involve moving a lot of dots on the screen. And it can be even more complex, is imagine if you divide between two processors all of the elements, and that one cache line of data happens to be touched by processor 1 and processor 2. So this is a situation where maybe no communication at all, maybe we just split the array in half. But for some reason now we have one cache line that gets written by both of the processors. So these are all examples of where um, uh, things can go. The performance of your code may not be what you expect because of these artifactual examples of uh, how machines work. So okay, so I'm going to skip these two. And I want to talk about one more concept, and that's contention. So contention, I'm going to give an example of students coming to talk to the TAs or to me for office hours, for, for help with an assignment. So there are three steps in this operation. The student wants to, to come see me, let's say to my office. I don't have an office in Tsinghua, but I do at CNU. And then if everybody comes to ask me a question, usually there's a line. 
So you have to st uh, stop and, and wait in line to ask your question. And then I'll answer your question. So this is typically how it works. Usually I will say, okay, I will start answering questions at 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock, I'll start answering questions, let's say. And all the students will go, ooh, I need to go ask questions at 3 o'clock. So the students have to do, they have to walk to my office, five minutes. They have to wait in line, and then they have to get their question answered. Maybe it takes five minutes to get their question answered. So let's think about the first student. The first student arrives right at 3 o'clock, or starts, he wants to get to my office at 3 o'clock. So he leaves at 2.55, and at 3 o'clock, he gets his question answered, and he's done 3.05. So the latency, how long did it take that student to get their question answered? 10 minutes. Okay. But now there's another student. Let's say, let's say my other student, well, she gets there right at, also right at 3 o'clock. But maybe right after the first student. So the second student has to wait for five minutes, and then they get their question answered. So the first student only took 10 minutes. The next student takes 15 minutes. Student that comes a little bit late, it may take a very, very long time to get their question answered. Now, so yeah, so first student, 10 minutes. Next student, you know, something like 23 minutes, and so on and so on. Now imagine I knew that I had to answer five questions. And I had everybody come at different times. 3 o'clock, 3.10, 3.20. So if I space my students out, if the students don't all come at the same time, I can guarantee that everybody gets done in 10 minutes. I don't have this long line that builds up. So, you know, again, both times are 10 minutes. So, in our programs, we often have situations, this is like rush hour in the subway, or rush hour on the highway. If everybody does something at the same time, the operation will end up taking longer than if we did the exact same work and spread things out just a little bit. So, for example, if all of the threads are trying to update my diff, they might spend a long time waiting for that block. But maybe we can do something where we duplicate resources or spread those students out so it doesn't take so long. And this was exactly the answer of why we went to multiple queues in Silk. We thought we might have contention for one work list, so let's make a bunch of other work lists. Here's an example from CUDA from last time. It's kind of an interesting example. So this is a common pattern in CUDA. And the only thing that you need to know is saying, I'm going to write to shared memory at index my thread ID. And I'm just going to write some, some data. So the way it works, who cares about the code, is let's look at it in pictures is I have 32 threads, all in a warp, running SIMD at the same time. And they're all going to uh, execute uh, the instruction, write a value to shared memory. And they all do this right at the same time. So the way shared memory works, the actual hardware, at, at one point, maybe it might not be true anymore, is that there are 32 different shared memories. And different addresses go to different versions of the shared memory. So if you want to write to address 0, it goes here. Address 1, here. 2, here. Address 32, here. 64, and so on and so on. So this is CUDA. So I can write, my thread can write to any address. Here I wrote to thread ID. But I can write to any address in shared memory. So let's think about three lines of code. Here's one line of code. Write a uh, read value the address thread index. One, two, three, four. Right? And notice that when every ad when every thread has a different address, every thread goes to a different piece <coughs> of the hardware. 
and the operation runs in parallel. Or, on number two, if every thread has an address that is relatively prime to 32, every thread also um, runs, uh, uh, reads different values. So address uh, um, three times index. So it would write, so thread zero reads zero, thread one reads three, thread two reads six, and so on and so on. So thread one, thread two, thread three, and so on and so on. But I can write a program like this where every thread reads, 16, reads the value 16 times its thread ID. So thread 0 reads 0, thread 1 reads 16, thread 2 reads 32, thread 3, uh, thread 3 reads 48, and so on and so on. And so now, every single request, all 32 requests, go to only two of the 32 different memories. So it's kind of interesting that this program takes one cycle to complete. This program takes one cycle to complete. This program will take 16 cycles to complete. Because all 32, or 16 of the 32 threads need this, these addresses. And 16 need these addresses. And the hardware can only give you one address per bank at a time. So these are all examples of, uh, of different types of contention. Okay, where are we at time? Didn't follow, so we're almost done. Okay, so I want to go very slowly through the last part here, because this will help you with your homework. Okay. So I'm going to give you a parallel programming problem. So here's, here's the problem, is that I have a grid, I have circle, or I have points in the grid. And your job is to completely in parallel compute this data structure. And this data structure says, for each of the cells, all 16 of them, I want a count of how many red dots are in every cell, and I want the IDs, the list of the particles in the cell. So in some sense, you can think about this as like a linked list for a grid cell. And I want to do this in parallel on a GPU, because assignment two is going to be a GPU. And remember that on a modern GPU, each core can run 2,000 threads, and there are 20 cores. So you need about 40,000 parallel, parallel things to do. So we can assume that the number of red dots is very, very large. Let's say it's millions. But the number of cells is exactly 60. Okay. And the reason why this is an important problem is that if you do any type of simulation, like uh, astrophysics or gal uh, it, or, or protein folding, a common operation is to say, tell me all the dots close to this dot. And if I had this data structure, all I could do is I could look in the squares right around this dot, and I would, only ha I would know exactly what the closest dots were in those squares. So this is a data structure that's very, very common in, a, in, a, in simulation. Okay, so let's look at my, my simplest answer to this question. Simplest answer to this question. I'm going to say for each of the 16 cells in parallel, for each of the dots, each of the particles P, if P is within the box of C, append P to the list for C. Make sense? Okay. So what I did here is I parallelized over 16 cells. I guess the, the simplest solution, if this was a sequential program, 
If this wasn't a parallel program, I would have done this. For each P, if P, uh, I would have said, uh, well, actually, I won't change it. I won't change it yet. So. Okay. So, does this program make sense? For each cell, for each particle, for each, each dot, if the dot is in the cell, add the particle to the list for the cell. Okay, so there are some problems with this. First of all, I only have 16 parallel things to do. And remember, I have 20 cores times 2,000 CUDA threads per core. 16, not enough. I need much more parallel. And then the other problem is that if this was a sequential algorithm, I probably would have just said, for each of the million particles P, compute what cells it overlaps, and add directly to those cells. Yet this, part, this problem says, for every cell, iterate over all of the uh, particles. So the cost is P times C, and I got parallel speed up C. So I took a problem that was O of P, I made it P times C, and then I made it C times faster, which wasn't very, <coughs> very useful. So maybe I change the program. I'm going to change the program is for each particle P, millions of them, completely in parallel, compute the cell containing P, which will be one of them, lock the list of cells, Add P to that list, and then unlock. This is correct program. O of P work. Tons of parallelism. Millions of parallel things to do. But what is unsatisfied? What is what is not good about this? I'm taking this lock on every single element, and remember, I have thousands of CUDA threads now. Maybe 40,000 threads are all taking one lock. This is exactly what I mean by contention. <laughs> okay? So, what's the first thing you would do to make this slightly, a little bit smarter? Remember that diff variable. Remember the other example of the diff variable. We used to take the diff variable on uh, every single iteration. How can you change this code to make less contention for the lock? Anybody see a simple answer? So the lock protects access to the data structure. But if two threads are updating different cells, they're not updating the same data. So I should be able to change this code so I have 16 locks, exactly. So now I'm going to make 16 locks, and I'm going to make a lock per list. Now I have 16 times less contention. 16 times less contention. But maybe this is still too much. I'm still taking a lock every single iteration of the loop. So what's another thing I can try? I'm going to jump to the, I'm going to give you one answer because I want you to try and think about a harder one. Is I'm going to do exactly what we did for the diff variable. For every single one of my threads, I'm going to make a copy of the whole data structure. And every thread is going <coughs> to, doesn't need any locks at all, just updates its own list. And then at the very end, I will combine all of those data structures together into one data structure. No locks. You know, this could be a little bit of a problem because now I have 10,000 copies of this data structure and I have to combine them. And what I want you to look at, because it will be very helpful for your homework, is yesterday Yan talked about select and prefix sum. And there's a way to do this with select and prefix sum and no locks at all and no duplication of data. And so I encourage you to review this slide 
because it will be very helpful for your written homework, and it will be very helpful uh, for your actual programming assignment. So this is a data parallel solution that uses no logs and has thousands of elements of parallel. So I'll stop there. I'll see everybody on Monday. Okay. All right. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. Thank <laughs> you.